Hey, and what up? This is Jackie K, and welcome for another Pokemon Sun and Moon K cast. I'm gonna try dividing it up again, and if it doesn't work this week, I suppose I can always put it back in the original K cast. But just yesterday, we got some new Sun and Moon news, and I figure I talk about it now instead of waiting for when I record the rest of the K cast. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll be sure to include a link to the Pokemon Sun and Moon trailer. Otherwise, you can just go to the Pokemon YouTube channel, and it should be one of the earlier videos. So the main focus of this trailer were new Pokemon, especially version exclusives. We got the first two version exclusives, at least that have been explicitly said as version exclusive, for Sun and Moon. And let's just say that both of these Pokemon, if you're making a Donkey Kong Country theme team, it's going to make that collection a lot easier. Or just any sort of monkey video game theme or monkey theme team in general. Because yep, we got some more primates on the party. First is a Pokemon Sun exclusive. Pam Sam? I believe this house pronounced. It's a pure fighting type, and it has a new ability called Receiver. Essentially what Receiver does, if you're in a double battle, triple battle, not positive if it will work in rotation battle, but in a battle where you have more than one Pokemon sent out at a time, when your partner faints, it'll gain the ability of the Fallen Ally. So I decided to go to the Pokemon website to look up more about the Pokemon. And it's basically being presented as a monkey. All set in the pack and everything. Just to show you what I mean. It's listed how their primary way of attacking is lobbing berries at the foe. They sometimes work in coordination with others, passing berries back and forth to confuse the opponent. And they don't just pitch hard berries that hurt them. They also have a technique where they use soft berries to observe the opponent's ability to see. So yeah, they throw berries at people's eyes. And the whole herd working as a team thing isn't exclusive to the wild. Because apparently they also want their trainers to have qualities of a leader. It watches trainers form as they throw a pokeball. And they won't listen to people who don't have a good form with their throwing arm. Pretty interesting Pokemon concept. I kind of doubt that all this battle stuff would come into play in gameplay. But it would be kind of interesting to see a Pokemon focused around throwing. I swear, if this Pokemon doesn't learn fling naturally, that will be just a wasted opportunity. As for the design itself, um, I like it. I can see how some people would find it a little uninspired though. It is yet another monkey Pokemon. It's kind of got more of a spider monkey look to it than some of the other Pokemon past though. I like the Pokemon. I'm not sure if I'll be able to use it on my team, but it's definitely a Pokemon that I want to use in the future. As for the moon exclusive Pokemon, it's called Oranguru, I believe. It's based off an orangutan, if the name didn't give it away. And it's a sage Pokemon according to the Pokemon bio. And eh, just some interesting trivia I thought I'd bring up. It's a normal psychic type, and it gets access to inner focus and telepathy. The latter being a lot more interesting for reasons I'll go into later with the Pokemon. It has an exclusive move called Instruct. Which I swear has been done before, but I can't put my finger on what. I must be getting confused with very similar moves like Follow Me and After You, I think is the other one. But essentially this move lets the partner use its most recent move again. So as it showed off in the trailer, a Pokemon used Surf, 
its ability to Alpha Fee allowed it to avoid taking damage, and then the Pokemon did its move to make it use Surf again, not getting out both party members after the second blow. So if double battles are a common thing in Sun and Moon, this is definitely going to be an interesting Pokemon for that alone. The bio of this one gets really interesting though, as I read up more about it on the Pokemon site. They're considered solitary Pokemon that prefer to live high up in the trees and meditate, and they were actually mistaken as humans deep in the forest of days of old, earning them the nickname the people of the forest. They're described as being very kind to the Pokemon around them, helping out hungry Pokemon and tending to the ill by giving medicine to the injured. And they act on their own accord, even using some items that normally are only usable by humans. And that spawned rumors that people have seen them using Pokeballs. And they make fans out of layers of the leaves bound into their own fur. So yeah, they actually made their own fans that you see them wearing using Sarah. And I wonder if any of this part of the bio is going to come into play in the gameplay. Considering how Pokedex entries and bios tend to be in the past, it's probably just flavored text, but I would like to see more Pokemon actually use human items. Like if there was a way you actually could have a hold of Hyper Potion to use or something like that. Again, just reading way too into it, flavor text rarely actually gets implemented into gameplay, but that is something I would love to see. So those were the two version exclusive, however, we also did find out about version exclusive evolutions, which I'll have to double check, and I'll make a note on YouTube if I confirm or deny it. But I believe this is the first time we've had exclusively version exclusive evolutions. I've seen, I, I recall situations where it's a lot easier to get a ball form of a Pokemon in one game than another, but I don't remember it ever being exclusive to one or the other game. But I got on a tangent there. Rockruff, a Pokemon we found out about real early on, when they were revealing Sun and Moon information, officially had its evolutions revealed. Before anyone says anything, I know there were Cora Coral Magazine links a while back, but as I've mentioned in past KCast, I don't cover leaks even from an official source like Coral Coral. Plus, it's nice to actually see them in action, visually, instead of just looking at a picture of them. First and foremost is the Midday Evolution, which is going to be exclusive to Pokemon Sun. They actually bothered to explain why it evolves one way in one game and not in the other, which I thought was pretty cool. Essentially, the... Shoot, I forgot the name already. But the Sun Legendary influence being stronger in Pokemon Sun emits more solar energy or something that makes it evolve that way. It basically, long story short, Sun Exclusive. While the Midnight form, the world of Aloha is under the influence of the Moon Legendary with all of the night magic and all that. So it evolves into the Midnight form in Pokemon Moon. As for what differentiates these two forms, they're both rock types, they both have the ability Kenai. The second ability they can get, however, is different between the two forms. Midday gets access to Sand Rush, while Midnight gets access to Vital Spirit. Midday form focuses more on being fast and sort of. <laughs> I don't know what the proper form of the word acceleration would be for that case. So let's assume it's that word I made up. Anywho, this is because it has access to a new move called Cell of Rock. <laughs> I'm not making that up. And it's a rock quick attack. Maybe even a rock extreme speed. I don't know, they didn't mention it, but I know looking it up on the Pokemon website, it is considered a rock move that always goes first. 
so it's likely like a quick attack or an extreme speed. And this might actually put a threat to Talonflame. R.I.P. Talonflame. How I will not miss you in the meta. I don't know about the Midnight form. It's kind of not as exciting. It's not getting any new new moves or anything. But it's focused more on waiting and then attacking. Having its move being counter. And by move I mean something exclusive to that form and not the other. Did I really not mention the names of these evolutions? I believe it's Lord Conorock. I don't think we ever got any official pronunciations yet, so... And you know how I am with pronouncing things on this show, so... Sorry about that in advance. It's not my fault this time. Going a little more into the Pokemon, midday Pokemon seem to focus on being intelligent, obedient. The site mentions them not living in packs, but laying out their territories in a way to avoid conflicts, and being obedient to their trainers, never portraying their partner, especially a phrase during their rebellious pre-evolution forms. That was my fault for butchering the pronunciation of, sorry. <laughs> As for the Midnight form, this it's bio mentions being productive, to, waiting for opponents to attack and then countering them, and their eyes glow for the thrill of battle. It can disobey trainers if they try to force them to battle, or give them commands they don't agree with, but they do develop a deep trust with trainers that draw out their true power. And that's all the new Pokemon that were revealed in that trailer. However, there was a couple other things that they made note of in it. Including, trainer customization coming back guys. Yep, the beloved feature of customization from X and Y is returning and it's got even more to it than ever. On top of changing clothing, you can also change your hairstyle, eye color, which I'm positive is new for Sun and Moon, hair color, which I'm not positive if it's new for Sun and Moon, but if it was, it was really hard to find it in X and Y. I know I never did. And I don't recall this from the trailer, but I've seen elsewhere on the internet that you can actually dye the clothing you get as well. So you can get different styles of clothes in different colors, and that is definitely something that was not in X and Y. Second new feature that we got out of that is Pokemon Refresh, aka Pokemon Me is coming back. It's going to have all the features Pokemon Me had, minus maybe the mini games. there was no mention of the mini games in there, but from what I could see in the trailer, everything else was intact and more. You still get to pet your Pokemon and feed them to raise their affection. This time it's Pokebeans. You notice that they always change the treats that Pokemon eat from generation to generation. Third gen was Pokeblocks. Fourth gen was Poffins. I don't recall them having any sort of sweets or treats for Pokemon in fifth gen. But sixth gen. Good lord. I had. This is actually my second take on this because the static of my mic. And I remember what the 6th gen suite was then. Why can't I remember it now? And I'll throw an annotation on the video. I swear it's going to come to me as soon as I'm done talking though. And 7th gen is Poke Beans. wonder why that changes so often. As I was going to say though, when you raise their affection so much, they'll be able to avoid attacks and withstand attacks that they normally would be defeated by. This isn't completely broken, but if it plays out the same way as X and Y, it might be kind of broken. Like you won't dodge every single attack, but I remember from X and Y, when you raise your affection all the way up, we're talking about a Pokemon and a me affection, by the way, not true affection. 
It felt like my Pokemon were dodging every other attack. Or at least dodging them so often that it felt a little unfair. Maybe they'll tone that down a little bit in Sun and Moon, but I um, guess it won't really matter in the long run since it's never something that comes into play in the multiplayer anyways. The new thing about Pokemon Refresh, which I'm actually pretty excited for, is how you can cure status conditions through it. The trailer shows a trainer curing paralyzation off a of Pokemon through the Pokemon Refresh, and the Pokemon website shows that happening with Poison. You can also brush dirt off Pokemon, but who cares about that? Really though, there's potential with this. It could be replacing items that you would normally buy, like antidotes and paralyzed heals and full heals. Granted, the latter is probably still good for in a battle, but you won't really be need to use your items outside of battle anymore. While it's not the last thing I want to talk about, the last thing we got revealed from the Pokemon Sun and Moon trailer are a couple new Z-moves. For Pikachu, guys, who saw this coming? I know I did. It's the freaking mascot of the series. Did anyone really not see this coming? I won't blame you if you didn't. Aloha Raichu having a Z-move was a bit of a curveball, but I still saw this coming. Anyways, this Z-move is Catastroca Pika, which I just got the pun of, and it made me actually like the move a lot more. However, despite the cute and yet hilarious animation of it, it still just looks like a netter generic super buff hitting powerful move. And we're gonna have a problem with Z-moves. I'm gonna at least have a problem with Z-moves. If there's not really any diversity in them and they're all just super powerful moves. With no real difference between one or the other. Besides maybe type. And don't get me wrong, I love the animation for it. I especially love the memes that spawn off it. <laughs> Take a look around the internet if you don't, if you have the time. There's a lot of funny jokes that have come out of it. However, there is hope. There is hope for the Z moves. To have it have the potential of replacing Mega Evolutions in my eyes. And out of all places it could be, is with a little Eevee. Yeah, freaking Eevee is getting a Z move. And it's called Extreme Evo Boost. It's a freaking 40 minute long animation of all the Eevee evolutions coming on screen and sharing their power with Eevee. And what does Eevee do with this power? Boost his stats. One hand, yes. A move that isn't just a standard attacking move. But stats boost on an AV? What good is that doing it, you may say? And well, I'll partially agree with you because... Heck, I think if even they made it drastically boost its stats instead of sharply, it could have made all the difference of EV actually being able to hold itself in battle. I feel the need to clarify if in case I have any Pokemon viewers that aren't as familiar with the series. Sharply boosting stats is a stage down from drastically boosting stats. It's not exactly doubling or tripling, but let's just say that sharply raising stats boosted up two stages, while drastically boosted up three. And heck, this is a Z move that can only be used once per battle. I think they could have gotten away with drastically raising the move, the stats. Grant is still all of his stats. Which brings me into how to actually make this useful. Are you guys familiar with a move called Baton Pass? If you're not, Baton Pass is a move that Eevee gains for leveling up. Where actually 
allows you to switch to another Pokemon while keeping any stats changes you've obtained through the battle. Normally when you switch, a Pokemon's stats are reset. But when you use Baton Pass, any boost that a Pokemon made of gain is transferred to the next Pokemon that comes out. So let's say you use a Evolution Z move, boost all your stats. You can then baton pass it to any heavy hitter you want. You want a Mac Jump to sweep all the chances? Go ahead, be your my guess. It's gonna obliterate them all. Got Alakazam? Make it an Alakabam! But I know what you're thinking. Jackie K, Eevee's still really frail. It's a baby. How do you expect it to even land enough ahead to pull off a Z move and then pull off a baton pass? Well, there's an item for that. It's called the Focus Sash. The Focus Sash allows you to withstand any hit that would have normally one hit KO you. It is consumable, so it'll go away after use, but. That gives you plenty of time to do the Eevee move and then do the baton pass with your hopefully raised up speed that makes you fast enough to actually move before the other Pokemon. And then you can get it off on any Pokemon that you wish. It'll be interesting to see if this makes it into the meta at all. I'm not sure if it's quite enough to make Eevee a more viable than any of his evolutions, but time will tell. Last thing I want to cover today is good news guys, we got a new update for Pokemon Bank. Or more information on said update. First, they said it's going to be coming out January 2017, but if I recall correctly, later on on the Pokemon site for the Pokemon Bank, they mentioned it's just coming out early in 2017. Hopefully that means January 2017 though. Because the games are coming out in November, so that'll be a bit of a wait either way. It's going to work as we suspect it would. You transfer from the 6th generation to the 7th generation, and it goes one way. Once a Pokemon from XY, Omega Ruby, Alpha Sapphire goes into Sun and Moon, they can't go back to those past games. You still can't hold on to tr held items. So you can't bring those lucky eggs you found on your adventure into the next generation of Pokemon. You'll have to find them again. And as we were told earlier, you will be able to transfer from red, blue, yellow virtual console games directly into Sun and Moon. It's going to be through the Poke Transporter tool, the same tool that you use to transfer Pokemon from not the 3DS games, but the original DS games onto the 6th generation of Pokemon. They'll be getting an update the same time Pokemon Bank is an update. So you can get your Fisher Mat Champs into Sun and Moon sometime in January. Hopefully. Well, I'm not excited for seeing your Fisher Mat Champs, but I don't want to delay Pokemon Bank coming out just to delay the inevitable. <laughs> What's actually new in this announcement and what I find the most potential out of this Pokemon Bank update is that it's actually going to get its own Pokedex. It'll be getting a national Pokedex feature in the update that makes it compatible with Sun and Moon and it'll be able to resave data from Sun, Moon, Omega Ruby, Alpha Sapphire, X and Y, basically your Gen 6 and Gen 7 games. And you'll be able to read entries through Pokemon Bank when it's updated. Unfortunately, they weren't clear enough about the feature that I'm most excited about with this. Will be in all two place for your Pokedex. Will this read and save the data onto Pokemon Bank? Or will it just read it from the game itself? Now, I know that may seem confusing, so... Let me try to clarify it a little. Let's say I do a playthrough of Pokemon X, catching all the Pokemon I can along the way, completing each of the regional Pokedexes 
because for some reason X and Y felt the urge to divide it up. They felt, oh, our Pokedex is so big, we have to have multiple regions, even though it's the same region. And then I do a playthrough of Alpha Sapphire, catching all the Pokemon I didn't catch in X and Y in that game. Now, without doing any training between X and Alpha Sapphire, if I were to load up Pokemon X into Pokemon Bank, and then load Pokemon Alpha Sapphire into the bank, would I have the Pokedex for just Alpha Sapphire, or would I have it for both X and Alpha Sapphire? Because if it's the latter, it's going to make things so much easier and just exciting in general for Pokemon collecting. For the longest time, I was hesitant to restart my Pokemon Platinum file because that was the one game I actually caught them all. The one game I actually completed the National Pokedex. Minus Arceus. But I never really had an event you could go catch it in Pokemon Platinum. There might have been one in-game event or something. For Mystery GIF I might have missed, but besides that, there was no easy way for me to get Arceus. Point being, I caught them all. I didn't want to lose that Pokedex progress. And I feel like if I try to catch them all in Sun and Moon, I'm going to run into the same feeling. If I want to restart the game, but I don't want to lose that progress. Besides that, if you want to complete the Pokedex from an older game to a newer game, it's not as simple as just catching a new Pokemon and then transferring from the old game. Sometimes you had to evolve Pokemon to get all the forms. Other times you had to do trades in game and out to complete the entries. And when you transfer to a new game, you have to do that all over again. Bringing some of your evolved Pokemon to get the other forms. And catching anything you might have lost in the void. Since the games have in-game rewards for completing the Pokedex, I doubt that will change, but it still would be nice to have some definite, always there record that I caught them all. Once I put the work in to catch every single Pokemon of a generation. Plus it would be nice if I didn't have to transfer every single Pokemon just to complete, just to have a complete national Pokedex. We'll just have to wait and see, but you can bet you and me, the second I get clarification on that, I will be all over it. First on social media, but I'll probably be mentioning it in the next KCast that comes up after I find out. And speaking of which, I think that'll do it for this one. This was just the Pokemon entry for the KCast. So I still have to talk about the other things that I normally do. I decided to separate the Pokemon Sun and Moon news from the rest of the KCast again. So I'm shooting to try to have a proper KCast by the end of the week. I'm still hesitant of whether I want to do this every week or every other week. And just report the Pokemon news as it comes up. But I'll have that narrowed out by the time the next KCast comes out. So I'll go over all that then. Until then, I hope to see you next time. Okay?